Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I talk funny. <laughs> um, we're going to do three sessions. Uh, the first one, I'm going to talk about some foundational, very important information that I think you'll find interesting. And then we'll talk in the second session about dinosaurs, because who doesn't like dinosaurs, right? And then in the third session, we're going to talk about natural selection. And I know all of you love natural selection, right? <laughs> but we're also going to refer that and talk about where the races come from because the Bible has something to say about that as well as science. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Now, I want to let you know that Creation Ministries International is literally international, and that we have offices in seven countries on five continents. We speak in over a 1,000 churches every year. Uh, one of our international offices is here in South Africa, all right? And I come from the office in, in the United States, and we're actually in, in five continents. And um, we also employ more PhD scientists than any ministry in the world. Pretty impressive, isn't it? But that's not what we're about. And let me see if I can explain that to you. How many of you, when you've been out sharing your faith, have had people ask you questions like this? Hasn't science proven evolution to be a fact? Don't we know science to prove that millions and billions of years have been in the universe? And by the way, what about dinosaurs? How did all the animals fit on the ark? Where did all the races come from? And why does a loving God allow death and suffering? Now, if you've had people ask you questions like that, would you do me a favor and put your hand up in the air? All right, now look around the room. Keep them up, look. You see, that's what our ministry is about, is to give you easy to understand answers that are both biblically and scientifically accurate so that you can defend your faith and help others come to know that the Bible is true so that they can come to know Jesus Christ. And you can find the answer to those questions and many more on our website. Our website address is kind of hard to remember, so if you don't mind, this morning we're going to do a little science, okay? I don't know if you know this, but it's been scientifically proven that if you say something out loud with your mouth audibly, it's more apt to be imprinted into your brain. Did you know that? It's science, all right? So would you guys join me in saying this all together now, ready? Creation.com, can you remember that? <laughs> well, if you were to go there this afternoon, you'd find over almost 12,000 articles written by our scientists and professionals around the world over the last 40 years, answering those and many more questions. For example, you guys know this fellow, right? We got some tragic news a number of years ago. What happened? Somebody tell me. He died, and how did he die? A stingray into the heart. And people wrote into our ministry, and they said, oh, yeah? Well, why would a loving God create stingrays that can kill? <laughs> gotcha. But you know what? I think it's a fair question. It goes back to apologetics 101. And when this event happened, our scientists and professionals wrote this article. And in only 10 days... It became our most visited article ever. And the reason that was is because of believers like you that subscribed to our email newsletter, received this article, and passed it on to their family and friends right when this news hit so that they could show them that there was an answer, a biblical and scientifically answer, uh, accurate answer to those questions. And you know what? In the news, we hear about dinosaur discoveries all the time or maybe the missing link between an ape-like creature and man that proves evolution is true. Have you guys seen that in the news? It's there all the time. Well, chances are we are writing an article at that time, and we can share it through our email newsletter. So if you guys want to be part of our ministry of sharing this information with others, I'd like to invite you to be on our email newsletter list. We only send out something about once a week or so, so we're not going to spam you but we are going to keep you up to date on the latest information. So, gentlemen, if you could uh, circulate those sign-up sheets, and if you guys could just pass those through, that would be awesome. Thank you. But how many people here know that, that kids in particular hear about evolution 24-7? Am I right? And if that's the case, where are they going to hear a biblical answer to that challenge? Is it going to be when they go to school? Huh? How about when they turn on TV, right? I mean, certainly by the time they get to be in the university. So please understand the heart of our ministry is to see believers like you equipped with this information for the sake of their children and grandchildren to show them the truth. And you can find the answers where again, everybody? 
All right, let's go ahead and get started with the presentation. Now, not only am I from the United States, but I'm from a place called California, all right? But I'm not a native of that state, and when I moved there, I had to adapt to my environment, okay? Like any good organism should, all right? And in order to prove to you that I became a great Californian, here is me catching a wicked 12-inch wave, all right? <laughs> and luckily, I have graphic artists that work for me that make me look a little bit more manly than I am. But I would like to introduce you to a real man. I don't know, do we have any of those here tonight or this morning? <laughs> Apparently not. All right, but anyhow, this is my friend Sammy. Sammy is a professional lifeguard on California beaches. And a number of years ago, he was assigned to one called Pismo Beach. But it was his day off, and he took his quad, and he was riding up and down sand dunes all day long, enjoying his day off. It was a hot day. But when the sun hit the Pacific Ocean, he knew it was time to go back to camp and rest up for his next day's work. However, in the darkness that night, when he came to this very spot on the beach, there were 12 people yelling and waving their arms. And when he rode over there and turned off his engine, he found out what the excitement was about. You see, there was a surfboard there at the feet of these people, but the surfer was about 100 meters off. And the waves that night had, been, uh, had eight foot faces because a storm had come in. And they picked up his body and threw him down into the rocks below and he was severely lacerated from head to toe. So Sammy had a tough decision to make that day. Because he was physically exhausted, he had no flotation devices, but nonetheless, he took off his boots and his helmet and those things that would weigh him down, <clears throat> and was able to get out to that man and bring him back to shore, and he saved his life. But let me ask you guys a question this morning. Why did he do it when those 12 people stood by and watched? Somebody tell me why. Right, he was equipped and trained. He knew the dangers that he was facing. But you know, I think those waves are kind of like our culture, in a way. Like, like in the surf, those waves are crashing down on people that we're trying to reach with the gospel with questions like, you know, is there a God? Does he love me? And is the Bible true? Now, am I right in our culture that that last question is answered mostly with a resounding no? Because evolution in millions of years are considered to be a scientific fact. In fact, I believe it's like a tsunami that are pulling people away from the truth of God's solid word, that rock that we're to stand on, the truth of his word. But I would like to start out with a question for you today. Actually, it's more of a challenge for you to consider this morning, and that is, are you willing to equip and train yourself with the answers to those tough questions that we'll be discussing today so that you can be the one that dives in and rescues the perishing while others perhaps just stand by and watch? You know, 1 Peter 3.15 says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, does this sound like a suggestion or a command? It's a command for every believer. And this word uh, answer comes from a Greek word, and that word is ap apologian, and it's a legal term used in the courts of law. And what it is, it's talking about what an attorney would do in order to uh, defend his client or maybe prosecute the accused. So, this morning, does this sound like you? Are you equipped right now? Are you prepared right now with a defense for your faith, including in the area where the Bible is being attacked more than any other place? And that's creation and evolution. And if you don't believe that's the most place, just go home, turn on television, open up magazines, read some books, because that's what most people hear 24-7. Well, I don't know how often you talk about science in church. Um, I seem to do it every week or so. <laughs> but did you know there's scientific statements in the Bible? For example, in the very first chapter of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, there's a phrase that occurs 10 times. It says that God created plants and animals to reproduce after their, what, kind. That basically means that dogs give birth to dogs, pigs give birth to pigs, and corn kernels bring us corn plants. And does that happen here in South Africa too? Okay, just checking. But when you think about it, 
It's a genetic statement that the DNA that God created in those original kinds, as it passes on its information, the DNA to future generations, that it can adapt to its environment, and I'm glad that God designed that into the, his creatures. But nonetheless, it's very clear that God created plants and animals to reproduce after their kind. However, most people hear a very different story than that, am I right? That most people hear that it's scientific fact that over millions and millions and millions of years, as a creature passes on its genetic information to future generations, through the process of natural selection and random mutations, which we'll be talking about a little bit longer, can actually change its genome, its genetic information, so that it will change into a completely different kind of creature over millions of years. Now, do you see the difference between these two accounts? And you know, our kids see the difference too. You know, if they're to go into science class, the professor may say, now, we're talking about science, and you see, these are facts. And if you happen to be one of those people that goes to church, and you believe Bible stories, I, I won't hold that against you. You can believe those Bible stories. But while we're talking about science here, I want you to let you know these are facts. You know, for example, if you believe that millions of Israelites walked across the Red Sea on dry land with two walls of water opposing gravity on both sides. Now, if, if those Bible stories give you hope and purpose and meaning in your life, that's fine. You can believe those Bible stories. But while we're talking about science, here we're talking about facts. Or if you want to believe that a man was in a fish for three days and some, somehow able to survive, or that Bible study where a man could walk on water that was not frozen, or that Bible story that says that a man was clinically dead for three days and was able to self-resuscitate. If those Bible stories give you hope and purpose and meaning in your life, I won't hold that against you. You can believe those Bible stories. But you see, this is science. Here we're talking about facts. So do you see the decision that has to be made? And folks, it's not just our kids, am I right? I mean, do any of you have people in your family that think you're a little nuts for believing the Bible because science has proven that evolution in millions of years are true? And so this morning, do you have a defense for your faith in this area? And if not, what's going to happen? You know, perhaps you've heard the Barna Institute statistics that say that two-thirds of Christians raised in, or children raised in Christian homes by the time they get to be the age 18 are leaving the faith. Now, I know that that was a, 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 a United States survey, but you know, when other denominations actually surveyed their people, they came up with different percentages. And of course, we're talking about somebody else's family, not ours, right? So the real question is, which percentage is acceptable to you and your family? I want to let you know that we did a, a survey where we uh, asked students in college campuses why they left the church, and 100% of them said that it was evolutionarily based. It's an important thing that we need to be known. But the good news is there is a reason, rational, logical defense for taking the word of God as it's plainly written. And when believers like you are equipped with this, giving it to their children and grandchildren, also sharing it with their neighbors, their co-workers, fellow students. There are people coming to the kingdom of God as believers share the truth, showing that the Bible is true. I mean, Jesus himself, he said, I've spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe when I speak of heavenly things? And that's why we're here this morning. And that's why Creation Ministries International employs more PhD scientists than any ministry in the world not to give you a bunch of science that goes over people's heads, but to give you an easy to understand answer that you can use that's both biblically and scientifically accurate. Now there's a lot of confusion about science, and one of the main reasons is, is because there are two definitions of science, all right, that are used in our popular culture. And when you're watching a program, maybe on television, about evolution, did you know they're switching back and forth between these two definitions and not telling you when it's happening? Well, let me explain that to you. 
See, on the one hand, we have what's called operational science or experimental science. You know, uh, do you guys remember using the scientific method maybe in school where you develop a hypothesis, you perform an experiment, you make observations, you record data, and you can repeat it right there in the laboratory. Do you remember doing that? You know, for example, let's say someone here this morning did not believe in the law of gravity. All right? We could actually do an experiment. We could go into the laboratory and test that law right here in the present and see if the evidence supports that. However, when we're talking about evolution, or for that matter, anything that happened in the past, did you know it's not this kind of science? What we're talking about is historic or what many call forensic science. You know, and let's say in the same way that someone here believed that a fish over millions and millions of years through the process of natural selection and random mutations could actually add information to its genome so that it would sprout new novel structures that would allow it to walk up onto to land, all right? Now, if you believe that story to be true, tell me, can you do an experiment to show that's the case? Can you observe it happening? Is it repeatable? Okay, do you see what I'm talking about here? Now this is a fossil, all right? This is Freddy the fish. I happen to know his name. He was swimming along happily, and then he got smushed. That's the scientific term, okay? Now let me ask you another question. Does this fossil exist in the past or the present? Okay, wait. Let me see if I can clarify the question a little bit. Does this fossil, this one right here in my hand right now, it, it's right here, does this fossil exist in the past or the present? Present, you see all the evidence we have exists with us in the present. And when we dig up a fossil, does it come with a label on it that tells us how old it is? or what it lives. See, what we have to do is take the evidence that's with us in the present and we paint a picture of what happened in the past because, if, if you'll let me listen for a minute. No, the evidence does not speak for itself. It has to be interpreted, all right? Now let me ask you another question. With a show of hands, who has the most evidence, evolution or creation? How many people say evolution has the most evidence? Okay, how many people say creation has the most evidence? All right, so can I ask you a follow-up question? Um, when the paleontologists are looking at the fossil record, all right, with the fossils that are in the museums around the world today, do the creationist and the evolutionist scientist, do they have the same or different evidence to observe in the present? It's the same, and when the astronomer is looking up at a distant galaxy and the light is coming back into a spectrometer. Do the evolutionists and the creationist scientists, do they have the same or different evidence to observe in the present? So let me ask you the question again. Who has the most evidence, evolution or creation? It's the same. It's the same evidence. You know, and I, I think historic science is like that television show CSI. I don't know if your church allows you to watch such programs. I, I only do so for research purposes myself. But in case you haven't seen the program, scientists are digging up evidence and facts about a crime that happened in the past, right? And that, those facts and evidence are presented to the court, to a jury, and to two attorneys, right? And it's interesting because one attorney is saying, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've seen the evidence. Obviously, my client is innocent. Yet the other attorney is saying, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I don't know what evidence he's referring to. You clearly saw that he's guilty, right? I mean, it's obvious. And this one's going to go, jury, did you notice he's misinterpreting the evidence? And this one's going, I'm not misinterpreting the evidence. He is. But folks, notice it's the same evidence, two completely different interpretations, and it's up to the jury, you, to decide which one makes the most sense. But folks, when it comes to the creation and evolution debate, in our culture, most people have only heard one side of the story, am I right? And men, they haven't come to church this morning, and I don't blame them for that. But if that's the case, who is going to tell them the other side of the story? 
All right, we're going to start out by taking a, lo a look at a little bit of evidence that makes sense of the historical account of the Bible. I'm going to start out with an icon of millions of years of evolutionary time, the Grand Canyon, which gives me an excellent opportunity to slip in a family vacation shot. But if you were to go to the Grand Canyon today, you would be told that it took millions of years to form those layers and millions of years for them to erode. And indeed, when we look at the process of sedimentation, that's the laying down of those layers, what we observe in the present is it seems to take a really long time for those layers to form in the present. So, if what's happening today is what's always happened in the past, then I would grant you it had to have taken millions of years. However, did you know that the evidence, <coughs> excuse me, the evidence shows that these massive layers were laid down by water? And where do we find layers like this? Excuse me. <coughs> where do we find layers like this? I mean, the Grand Canyon, but anywhere else? Perhaps on my drive here from Cape Town today, right after that tunnel, do you see all that, those layers? I want to let you know, no matter where you go in the world, if you start digging, you're going to find sedimentary layers that are very kilometers deep, huge layers. And guess what's inside those layers? Fossils. So let me ask you a question this morning. Can you think of any historical event recorded in the Bible that might explain massive sedimentary layers laid down by water, including the evidence of dead things covering the entire planet? Does anything come to mind at all? And then, in fact, I had a 16-year-old young man come up to me and he said, you've got to be kidding. You guys claim to be scientists. Yet your Bible says that the highest mountains in the world were covered by water, and there's not enough water to do that. <laughs> gotcha. So how do you answer a question like that? <clears throat> well, I get excited because I can show him this. <laughs> do you remember from maybe your uh, primary education that 70% of the planet is covered by extremely, incredibly deep oceans? In fact, they're so big that if you were able to take the ocean basins and raise them up, push the mountains down and reform our planet like a perfect sphere, like a basketball, okay? Did you know that there would be almost two miles of water covering this planet with just the water that's in the oceans today? Now, does that sound like enough water for a cataclysmic worldwide flood like the Bible tells us about? Especially considering what we now know about plate tectonics and those forces that we understand raise those mountains out of the great deep. And you know what? It's more exciting than that. Because you see, in the sedimentary layers of the highest mountains in the world, all right, what we find is fossilized marine invertebrates. That's clams and crabs, including at the top of Mount Everest, indicating that those layers, now at the top of the highest mountains in the world, were one time underneath the oceans just like God's word has been telling us all along. So ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you see the evidence? It supports the Bible, not millions of years of evolutionary time. And speaking of those layers taking millions of years, how about this? Here we have about eight meters of thousands and thousands of layers of rock. Now, did these take millions of years? Actually, these layers were laid down in three hours. It happened on June 12th, 1980, right after the eruption of Mount St. Helens in the United States, which made a little impact on me since I was 63 miles from the volcano when it erupted. And this is just a little bit of the ashes that were three inches thick in my parents' front yard. Also an excellent opportunity to slip in a family vacation shot. But if you were to go to Mount St. Helens today, you would find this canyon. Now, this canyon is huge. It's 1 40th the scale of the Grand Canyon. And if you weren't there to see it form, you would assume logically that it took a really long time for that little river to carve through those layers of rock. But you would be wrong because this canyon was formed in only one day. It happened on March 19th, 1982, after a flow came through here at highway speed all right, that carved through the layers that were then soft, which decades later have been turned to stone. 
Now, does that remind you of anything else you've seen before? Makes you wonder what a global flood would do. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you see the evidence? Does not take millions of years. Now, that same young man that challenged me about the water, he said, wait, you guys talking about fossils all the time, and you say you're scientists, but everybody knows it takes millions of years to form a fossil. Ha, gotcha again. So how do you answer a question like that? Well, I get excited. <laughs> we get to talk about where fossils come from. Well, if you were to go to a museum or perhaps open a textbook, you're likely to find an explanation where Mr. Dinosaur dies and goes to the bottom of the ocean, is slowly buried over millions and millions of years. And then millions of years later, through the process of permineralization, is turned to stone. Now, I will admit at one time that made sense to me. But is this what we observe in the real world? Well, a number of years ago, I took my daughter to Walmart. Okay, that's a great place to shop in the United States. And I bought her two goldfish. And she named them Romeo and Juliet. All right? <laughs> now, that was a Thursday afternoon. And just two days later, on Saturday morning, at 5 a.m., she is yelling from her room, Daddy, Daddy, come in here quick. Look, look, you've got to see this, Daddy. Hurry. And I want to let you know, at 5 a.m. on a Saturday morning, I'm an exceptionally kind and gentle father. <laughs> so I came into her room, and I said, What? And she goes, Look, Daddy, Romeo is kissing Juliet. And as gentle as I could tell her at that time of the morning, I rubbed my eyes and confirmed that indeed Romeo was not kissing Juliet, but Romeo was, well, eating Juliet. Uh, poor Juliet. And if any of you have fish tanks at home, one of your precious fish die, where do you find it? It's going to be floating on top. If you don't believe me, you can do an experiment, get a drop of cyanide, put it in the tank. And, no, you don't want to do that. No, I didn't do that. My wife didn't think it was funny, so I didn't try it out. But is there any evidence that supports this idea that the only way we can get a fossil is through rapid burial, like we would have in a worldwide flood? Well, take a look at this. Here's a fish that was buried so quickly it was caught right in the middle of having lunch. Or how about this? Here is an ichthyosaur in the process of giving birth. Now, ladies, I've heard your stories of really long labors, but millions of years? How about this? Here's a hat that was buried for only 20 years. You might say it evolved from a soft hat into a hard hat. Here is a bag of flour after only decades turned to stone. And this teddy bear, it took only three to five months to be completely calcified and classified as a fossil. Again, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, do you see the evidence? It does not take millions of years as evolution would require. Now, I have an important question for you right now, and that is, did you guys understand those examples that I just gave you? I mean, was I talking over anyone's head? And you know, I, I think that's important because I want to see if you can picture yourself sharing information like this with your children and grandchildren, maybe your neighbors, your coworkers, fellow students, those people that we are called and commanded to share the gospel with, to show them that actually the evidence supports the historical account of the Bible. And can you imagine when we do, can you imagine what the Holy Spirit can do through, through his word to bring people to Christ? Now, I, I already know some people are thinking about it. In fact, some people have come and discussed this with me even before I started. And they, they, the idea that, you know, what's the big deal about millions of years? You keep talking about it. I mean, after all, the Bible is a book of morality. I mean, shouldn't we stick with important doctrines of the Bible? However, do you think adding millions of years into the Bible, if we could do so, do you think it might impact some important doctrines? Let's take a look at that. You know, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, there are these genealogies. God thinks they're pretty important. I think one of the reasons is he's trying to show that Jesus was a direct descendant of Adam, which he absolutely was. That's recorded clearly in Scripture. But in the Old Testament, notice that it says that so-and-so was sold when his son was born, and he was sold when his son was born, and he was sold when his son was born. You know that? You can add up those times, and you'll get a reliable amount of time from Abraham or from Adam all the way up to Abraham. Does that make sense? 
And notice after that, God thinks it's really important to tell us how long the captivity in Egypt was, how many years it was, and then how long the exile was, and that this king ruled for this many years, followed by this king for this many years, this king for, you guys notice all those, and how long the exile was? God is trying to give us some specific amounts of time, and if we take a clear reading of scripture, will you agree with me on this, that if we take a clear reading of scripture, we have an absolute time frame from Adam all the way up to Jesus. Would you agree? All right. Now, if we know that time frame and we know all the ancestors and all the history that happened in that time, all right, and we want to squeeze and force millions of years into the Bible, can we fit them before Adam? Or can we fit them uh, between Adam and Jesus? No. So that means if we're trying to force them in, we have to go before Adam, right? And a lot of people do that. I've even talked to somebody about it this morning. But now we have a theological problem that I'd like to introduce to you. It's right here. Because these fossils that they say took millions of years are dead things, right? And that would mean we have death before the fall. Death before the curse. Now, does it sound like we might be touching on an important doctrine? Well, let's take a look at this a little further. You see, in the last verse of Genesis 1, God said that his creation wasn't just good on the seventh day, but it was what? Very good. So what does a very good world look like? Well, check this out. You see, just a couple verses earlier, God said, I give you plants for food. I don't know if you know this, but that means in the beginning there was no brie. Did I use that term right in South Africa? Did I just blow my whole cover? We call it barbecue in the United States. Is that brie here? Bry. I might as well just leave. I've lost all my credibility here. (laughs) Bry. Excuse me. Okay. But anyhow, that means there was no yummy meat. All right? (laughs) But notice in the next verse, he gives the animals the same command. He said, I give you plants for food. So if we're taking the Bible as it's plainly written here, in the beginning, both man and animal were what? Vegetarian, which comes from an ancient Hebrew term that means bad hunter. Okay, but don't worry, in case you had some bacon with your eggs this morning, notice that later on in Genesis, God said, just as I gave you green plants for food, I now give you everything for food, which some people use as biblical justification to eat things like this, all right? However, everything, well, some of you got it, okay, but anyhow, But you've got to understand what a very good world was like. You see, it was a paradise. The Garden of Eden was a perfect place. And and we were created in God's image, all right, in order to live with our creator in perfect harmony. And there was no death, there was no sorrow, there was no pain. Animals did not kill, and we did not kill. It was a beautiful place, but... You guys know we don't live in a world like that anymore, do we? Because something went terribly wrong. You see, when God, he, he commanded Adam and Eve, he said that when you eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will surely what? Die. You see, so when Adam disobeyed God, death came into the world. Now, let me ask you a question. Does it make sense to you that... This perfect paradise where there was no death, no sorrow, no pain would be built upon millions and millions and millions of sedimentary layers that are a record of death and destruction required by evolution. Does that make sense to anyone here? All right? You see, basically the gospel is this, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. It was a perfect paradise. There was no death, no sorrow, no pain. We were to live with our creator in perfect harmony. But when Adam sinned, every descendant of Adam inherited a sin nature, which would include everyone in this room, everyone that's ever lived on this planet, and everyone that ever will. Because we, live, uh, we have a merciful and loving God, but he's a just God, and you should be thankful for that. Yet in God's love and mercy, he sent a rescue mission, am I right? He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to take the penalty of death on our part, to become the Lamb of God, sacrificed for our lives. So that, and this is the important part of the gospel I want to emphasize tonight, so that in the future, when God creates a new heaven and a new earth, right? Did you know what? There will be no more sorrow, no more pain, 
for those that are in Christ. Is anybody else looking forward to that? And yet when we take that perfect paradise and build it on millions of years of bones of death and destruction required by evolution, do you see we turn the gospel upside down? Paradise created, paradise lost, paradise regained in the new heavens and new earth. And don't you think it's about time we as believers told the true gospel? And speaking of causing division in the church, because that's what a lot of people say, you talk about millions, that causes division in the church, okay? Yeah, I mean, after all, why should we limit God to our creator? Because we, we, we worship a big creator, and he could have created in any way he wanted, including using millions of years. And I, I will agree with you. He could have created in any way he wanted, but don't you think it's about time that we allow God to tell us how he created through his inspired and inerrant word? And speaking of causing a huge division, what about this guy? This guy caused a huge division in the church, didn't he? And this is what he said. He said, when Moses writes that God created heaven and earth and whatever is in them in six days, if you cannot understand how this could have been done in six days, then grant the Holy Spirit the honor of being more learned than you are. For you are to deal with scripture in such a way that you bear in mind that God himself says what is written, but since God is speaking, it is not fitting for you wantonly to turn his word in the direction you wish to go. Now, the nature of our culture might be better stated by a more modern theologian that you're familiar with. <laughs> and this is what he said. They, the church, used to hang the whole thing on one hook. If you don't do these things, if you don't act morally, then you're going to burn in hell. But listen to what he said next. Unfortunately, with what we know about science, you know what he's talking about there, right? Anyone, excuse me, he said, anyone who thinks at all probably doesn't believe in fire and brimstone anymore. So organized religion, you have lost that voice to hold up your moral hand. Does that remind you of anything else you've heard before? He's basically saying, now that science and evolution have proven that the Bible is not true, then that means that the morality, which is in the same Bible, is also not true. So you Christians have no right to tell me how to live and be moral according to your Bible because it's been tr proven to be incorrect. But I'll tell you what we're going to do. If you want to believe those Bible stories and if they give you hope and purpose and meaning in your life, that's perfectly fine. I, I won't hold that against you. That way you can believe what you want to believe and I'll just believe what I want to believe and we can coexist, right? That way you'll be okay and I'll be. Wait, am I going to be okay? in an eternal consequence. So do you see how this is a reflection of our culture? So, are you prepared to demolish arguments like this that are, that are put up in order for people to be turned away from the word of God? Now, I know this morning we've only had just a little bit of time, and there are a lot of questions that are out there. We're going to deal with some more as we go into the next two sessions, things about dinosaurs and radiometric dating and and races and natural selection, those kind of things. And I want to let you know I had questions about that when I was a young man and I was in the church and I asked questions and the answer I usually got was, Scott, just have faith. But is that obeying this command? How many people here know that there's a battle for the souls of men waging right now? I mean, in fact, perhaps there's people in your family that haven't come to the Lord. And I would say that many of them, if not most of them, in the back of their mind, they're thinking the Bible's really not true. And perhaps that's because they've been told over and over again that millions of years in evolution are a fact. All right? But if there is a battle, should we be unarmed? And if there is a battle, shouldn't we as Christians be on the front line of that battle? And I want to let you know, the Bible is being attacked more than any other place in our culture right in this area in the creation and evolution debate. Again, if you don't believe me, turn on the television this afternoon. It's everywhere you go. So I don't know if you're like me, but I, I remember about 10% of sermons for 10 minutes, and then poof, it's gone. I'm sure that's not true here in this church. You guys meditate on the sermon all week long, right? But let me ask you, if you watch the recording of a sermon a second or third time, do you remember it better? So I hope you don't mind me being practical right now. All right? 
Because in order to be equipped, it does take some effort. You guys probably notice that we have some resources on the tables over here. And these, these have answers to the questions that we're going to be discussing today and so many more that you can use and be a, 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 an ambassador for the truth of God's word with your family and your friends. But I would like to emphasize one particular resource that stands out above the rest is the ones that we get the most testimonies of people coming to know Christ, and that's Creation Magazine. This goes out to 110 countries. It's the most read publication of its kind in the world. It's 56 pages long, and there's no advertising. It comes out quarterly. And I don't know about you, but if you get magazines at home, if you pulled all the advertising out, would you have 56 pages left? All right, but what's left in here isn't just a good recipe for butternut squash. Okay? What we're talking about is some excellent information that you can use in order to change people's mind. And just as a little incentive, if you do subscribe to the magazine today, I, someone came up to me and said they had subscribed for, was it 12 years, I think it was? Somebody here, was that you, ma'am? Yeah. But anyhow, if you do subscribe, all right, for a one-year subscription, you'll get a free back issue to take with you and start reading this afternoon. But if you do a three-year subscription, you'll not only get a back issue, but you'll get two, actually three DVDs. This one here is a two-DVD set that covers some of the information that I'm going to cover today as, and as well as more that uh, talks about the basics, as well as this, who was produced by Dr. John Sanford from Columbia University, who has, holds the patent for the gene gun, which, uh, which changes genetic information. That's the technology about, do you think he might know a little bit about genetics? <laughs> and yet what he's doing is talking about how Darwin didn't understand science in the right way and that he got some things wrong. It's a great tool. So in a moment, we're going to circulate some sign-up sheets. Now, obviously, we need to get some names and addresses on there, so it'll give you time to do that. But for just a little bit more, all right, you can get the digital version, all right? Now, up to five devices can get their own copy. So your children and grandchildren, family and friends, whoever you choose, up to five people, will get digital copies in addition to the one you get uh, posted to your home. So in a moment when you get this, take that. And if you'll pull off that little coupon on the right and take it back to the table, they'll take care of getting you your free gifts. So gentlemen, if you could circulate those now. And just as those are going around, I'm just going to give you two examples of information you would get in the magazine. What about carbon dating? Anybody heard about that? They say it proves millions of years, right? Well, actually, it doesn't. We can talk about that in the Q&A. But here's an example of potassium argon dating, where they took a, a sample from a volcanic lava dome, and they got an age of 300,000 years, 350, excuse me. Then they extracted a mineral from the same sample, and this time it was 900,000 years, okay? And then they extracted another mineral, and this time it was 1.7 to 2.8 million years. Now, it was the same sample sent to the same potassium argon dating lab, but they got all these different dates. So which one do you guys think is right? Actually, this is the correct date, because this sample came from Mount St. Helens and was formed only 10 years old uh, before. So when we get dates from radioisotope dating of rocks, when we know how old they are, and they're incorrect, obviously, right? Do you think that brings into question the dates of rocks when we don't know the age? Okay? And let me give me one more. In fact, I'm going to hit on dinosaurs here because this is my favorite thing to share with people when I'm on the airplane. All right? Yeah, my kids say, are you that kind of guy? Yes, I am that guy, right? But that is that a number of years ago, Dr. Mary Schweitzer, who was uh, underneath uh, uh, Dr. Peter Horner, all right, found inside dinosaur bones, she found red blood cells. I'm pausing dramatically for you to think about this because they say they got extinct over 65 million years ago and she found red blood cells. And this is what she said. She said, I got goosebumps. It was exactly like looking at a slice of modern bone, but of course I couldn't, what? Believe it. I said to the lab technician, the bones after all, they are 65 million years old. How could blood cells survive that long? And guess what? It got more exciting because later on they dissolved the bony matrix and they found this tissue inside dinosaur bones. Does that look 65 million years old to you? It was stretchy, all right? And this is how she reacted to that. She said, it was totally shocking. 
I didn't believe it until we'd done it, what? 17 times, right? And you know what? She didn't believe it. And you know what? I don't blame her because sometimes our faith is strong in what we believe and it's hard to let go. But I would like to share with you a different interpretation of this evidence that I hope will become more clear as we go through this morning that our scientists have discovered. Are you guys ready for this? The dinosaur bones are not 65 million years old. Okay? So anyhow, I hope you guys have enjoyed this uh, presentation. And um, we'll go ahead and get together. You can find the information where again, guys? I just want to talk about the answers book. We're going to be doing some Q&A. That's over there. That's the most prime thing that you can get besides the magazine. Create the Refuting Evolution, all right, is the best-selling creation book of all time, and it comes in a pack over there, the starter pack, for a lower price. Also, I want to point out Evolution's Achilles Heels. This went second place at the Christian Worldview Film Festival. You can be using that. It's an awesome thing. And if you don't like reading, we've got you covered right there on the middle table, too, all right? But see, information like this didn't even exist. Uh, 20 years ago, and I think right now is an exciting time to be a Christian because we have the answers. But I want to conclude with the question we started with, and that is, are you willing to train and equip yourself with the answers to the tough questions that we're talking about this morning so that you can be the one that dives in and rescues the perishing while others just watch, and you can fulfill this command to always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. All right, thank you.